Kia ora te whanau. Um, uh, ko Ken Shelley, aho. Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, God bless you. Thank you so much for coming out this morning. Uh, it is, uh, do you know, I said this morning earlier, I'll say again, it is so lovely to be amongst friends. And that's how it feels. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a real privilege and a joy to, to come and be with you here this morning. Um, it's wonderful too, and an honour, uh, to share in the last of your series on a healthy church. It's somewhat ironic to me that I am doing this last in the series on an ironic church, uh, you know, uh, on a, a healthy church, when I, in fact I'm as crook as anything. Uh, my old grandmother used to say, "I'm feeling a bit queer." She used to say, when she meant I'm feeling a bit ill. Uh, of course, language changes uh, from <clears throat> as moves on. So I will just say crook. Okay, you you understand what I'm talking about here. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to try to be brief, um, both for the sake of my voice because it's getting gravelier and gravelier, um, but also for your ears, because it must be awful for you. Bless you for putting up with it. Um, my theme this morning, as the last on your series on the healthy church, is actually... Uh, ah, please work. Do you know what? I left it on. Oh, there it is. Beautiful. It's actually on the Bride of Christ. Uh, and it's just a wonderful thrill to be able to, to share this with you. Uh, and particularly the texts from Revelation 19 and Revelation 21. Here we are. Here's Revelation 19. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like a roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. And then if we flip over in your Bibles to uh, Revelation 21 verses 1 to 4. It says, and then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. Now let me just stop there for just a moment because I love the sea. I don't know about you. Uh, it's so lovely to see the sea out here. It's lovely to travel the seas. How comes in the new heaven and the new earth there's no sea? Well, it doesn't mean that there will be no water, there'll be no oceans. I am absolutely convinced and sure that there will be. Sea in Revelation is the place from where evil comes. Sea is the place where maliciousness, nastiness, evil, conquest lurks and threatens. And guess what? There's none of that in the new heavens and in the new earth. Hallelujah. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Hallelujah. So I hope you haven't caught my cold. Because <laughs> that's quick if you have. <laughs> well, listen, uh, uh, that's a picture of my uh, darling wife a couple of weekends ago. My wife and I celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. Yeah. And uh, I, of course, bought her 40 red roses. Yeah, they are. That's good. <laughs> and I took out a small mortgage. Yeah. <laughs> um, why? Well, because on our wedding day we had red roses. Yeah, of course it's lovely. They're a symbol of romance, aren't they? It's lovely. But on our 20th wedding anniversary, I ordered some red roses a few weeks before the day and ordered them to be delivered. And on the card I wrote 20, full, 20 red roses for 20 wonderful years. Now what neither Carol or I knew is that between me ordering them and, and them arriving, 
is that I would be taken to hospital and Carol on that day was sitting by my bedside wondering if I would live or die. And on that day, when she got home, there were 20, 20 roses with 21 roses for 20 wonderful years. So, of course, come 40 years, I have to buy 40 roses with the same line. 40 red roses for 40 wonderful years. Now, I haven't told you that to demonstrate what a soppy old romantic I am, but to direct you towards the emotion in our theme today. You know, the church, you know this. You're very aware of this. The church is so, is not buildings. It's not. It's not services, where well, we have them. It's not services. It's not meetings. It's not structures. It's not organisations. You know the church isn't those things. You may have some of those things. You may not have some of those elements. But it's not fundamentally who the church is. And, of course, it ringing our ears, of course, is that it's the people. Yes, of course it's the people, but it's something greater than just the people. It's who these people are. Who is the church? It's a people who are something because of what God has done. Who are you? Who is the church? Well, I'll tell you what the Bible says. It says you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. His, in the old version it said, his peculiar people. Uh, yeah, funny. Again, language changes, doesn't it? Uh, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Who are you? Who is the church? Who are we? We're those who are chosen by the Father. That's who we are. We are those who have been won by the Saviour. That's who we are. We are those who are empowered by the Spirit. That's who we are. It's an extraordinary thing, but underneath all of that, underneath all of those truths and under all those metaphors and pictures of who the church is, under girding all the extraordinary identity that is heaped upon the church in the New Testament, the church is the people of God in a relationship of covenant love with their Lord. Let me say it again. With covenant love with their Lord. It is a glorious church. Why? Why it was glorious? Because of what he has done and who he has made us to be. It's no surprise then, Given the undergirding, every metaphor of the church, whether it be building or whether it be a, a body, whatever all the other metaphors are, underneath it, a covenant love. It's no surprising then that they do use in the New Testament, actually through the whole Bible, a metaphor of wife or bride or beloved for the people of God. Because it speaks of a beautiful, devoted, committed love. And if some of you guys are just feeling a little bit uncomfortable with being the bride of Christ, I will point out that we often ask the ladies of our church to be remembered to be the sons of God. So in just the same way, we just have to kind of live with that metaphor. Now let me just say that it's no surprise then that when you get to the end of the Bible, at the end of the book of Revelation, and we have one of those moments, they're not all these moments, but we have one of these moments in the book of Revelation when it looks into the future. One key way of seeing the church is as the bride of Christ. Now, I'm just going to get slightly philosophical with you, if, if that's okay. Do you, do you mind, Jamie? Is it, do, you, do you mind a bit of philosophical? No, okay, we'll, we'll do that. Okay, metaphor. Can I just share your idea of the metaphor, the picture? Metaphors, I'll say it and then I'll explain it. Metaphors are not projections onto God of something. They are representative. So when I look at this rock, this is a small piece of granite from my collection, and I look at this rock, I don't go, ooh, that's a nice, that's a nice weighty rock. God is like a little bit like my rock. 
You know, he's strong, he's reliable, he's something you can stand on. You know, I project that onto God. Do I? No, 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 no. no that's not it. That's not what's going on. Here is the reality. There is this rock who is called God. He is the rock. He is the ultimate embodiment of rock. And this little rock is in some small way like the rock. Firm, permanent, solid. Oh, this isn't really solid. It will get washed away eventually, but he won't. You you hear what I'm saying? Right. I'm still remaining philosophical. Right. Another metaphor. Shepherd. We love it. We love it. Shepherd psalm. It's not a projection. Someone didn't walk around and go, oh, it's a shepherd. Oh, God's a little bit like that. That's not, no, it's not how it is. Here's the reality. God is the shepherd. He is the great shepherd. He is the one who cares and provides and leads and protects. He is the shepherd, and a regular shepherd that we see active and doing whatever they do is in some small way reflective of what that great shepherd is really like. Yeah? You with me? So too with the metaphor and the picture of Christ being the bridegroom and his people being the bride. It's not a projection that we have to kind of be put up with. What it is is behind it is the ultimate story of love and commitment in the whole universe. That ultimate story of love and commitment in the whole universe. And the love and marriage between a man and a woman is but a small reflection of that greater and eternal truth that is this, that God our creator wanted to be united with his creation, especially the people he made in his image. And that union is to be one of a committed, deep, covenantal love. Yeah? Enough philosophising. Okay. The other thing to explain is this. And then I'll get on to my points. The other thing to explain is this, is how... Marriage and betrothal worked in the ancient Jewish world. Well, back in the day, back in the ancient Jewish world, in the times of the Old Testament and New, well, this is what happened. Is that there'd be this young couple, this lad, this girl, who were going to get married, and uh, their family would have to agree, and there was all that kind of going going on. You read in in the Bible all about it, and you see it. But this is how it worked. They would be betrothed to each other. The day would come when they would be betrothed. And about a year later, that betrothal would become marriage. But the betrothal isn't a bit like our... It's not like our engagement, which is a little bit hit and miss. You know? You know how many times you... No, I won't ask. You know, but, you know you can, engagement is a bit hit and miss. You know, you, you, she can say one, yes one day and no the next, right? It happens. Sometimes, sometimes it does. <laughs> Betrothal was actually really, really serious back in the day. And you were betrothed, like Mary and Joseph were betrothed. And there there was coming a day, about a year later, when you would come together, you'd have a wedding service, you'd you'd be united, as it talks about in the Bible, you'd you'd sleep together, you'd be uh, be free to, uh, to be together and create a new way of life forward together. It was a serious commitment yet to be consummated. It was a time to get ready. And so too, we, like the betrothed, are committed in a committed relationship, being prepared for and getting ready for the wedding, that great wedding, that great feast at the end of time when the bride will be presented to the lamb and the lamb will be presented to the bride and the great wedding feast will happen. We're in that time right now. I've got three points, of course. You're kind of obligated to, aren't you? So here's the first one. The church is chosen and loved by Jesus. Therefore, we should treat the church with respect. The church, whether the national, denominational, local church, we all accept that the church, bless it, bless her, is full of faults and full of problems. 
and part, partly because it's full of people. <laughs> You know, you add me to a church and you've got a problem, right? You know, this is, this is just the reality of it. Um, we are like that. We cause these difficulties. And then also because we have this habit in the church. I don't know, where did it come from? But it's been going on for centuries. We have this habit of turning something which is organic and of the Holy Spirit and turning it into an institution, don't we? We have a habit of doing that. And so the church, bless the church, is full of faults and it's full of problems. And it does seem to me that God seems to take great pleasure in loving the unlovely, in promoting the unlikely, and using the weak. Do you know, I just struck this week, I hear of circumstances where actually you hear of great success and I don't see the unlovely, the unlikely, or the weak. And I think, is it God? Yeah? Because that's what God seems to want to do. But it's easy for us, isn't it? Especially those of us who have been hurt by it. It's easy to focus on the failings and the frustrations. Should we ignore them? Absolutely not. We should not ignore the failings and faults of the church. We should call it out. And we should focus on that which is greater. What, what is the greater? Well, the greater is that the bride, the church is the bride of Christ. Chosen and loved. And Paul says something very extraordinary in Ephesians 5. You think he's saying one thing and then all of a sudden he says something else. He says, he quotes the Bible, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they sh- the two will become one flesh. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, this is a profound mystery, Paul says. And you go, yeah, it is, that a man would leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Crikey, as Jesus said, the, the out of the two becomes one. Wow, this is extraordinary. Yeah, it's, it's a mystery, it's a mystery. And then he says, oh, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. And you go, whoa, hang on a minute. Hey, what are you saying? What he's saying is that the church is the chosen and beloved bride. He's saying that this is what Jesus feels about the church. He's saying Jesus and the church are profoundly united. Whoa. You touch one and you touch the other. Hey, don't mess with the church. (laughs) Why? Because it's the bride of Christ. Chosen and loved. Now listen, who in the world, in their right minds, would ever complain to a soon-to-be bridegroom about the failings and faults of his bride? Who would do that? Who would be as mad as to do it? So you've got a groom, I know, sitting down here, I imagine, longing for his, his bride to arrive. Oh, Teresa, Teresa, he's just calling out. Oh, oh, my love is about to arrive. And these groomsmen go, oh, yeah, but you should have seen her last night. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, she's not much of a looker, is she? He goes, you, who would do that? Who would do that? Well, you wouldn't, would you? You, you, Well, I won't say what would happen, but you just wouldn't. Do you know I went to a wedding once? Do you know that uh, once, I've been to more than one, actually, I went to this particular wedding, and I sat through the the father's speech. Do you know the father didn't say one nice thing about his, his daughter? Not one. I think he thought he was being funny. I got to the end of it, and I thought, he hasn't said one nice thing. Who would do that? Who would do that? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I wasn't terribly worried about my wedding day. I was very concerned about what was, you know, a new life I was going to have with my wife from there on. Don't get me wrong. I was looking forward to it. But it wasn't a big deal to me. All right? But I did get an insight. I went in a Rolls Royce with my daughter, who was dressed in her wedding gown. And she looked amazing. And I went in this Rolls Royce up a hill to a church. And as I walked down that aisle with her on my arm, I have never felt such pride and joy. I grinned so much, my face ached for days afterwards. And it wasn't just that the, the, you know, the, the, she was off my hands, you know, do you know what I mean? It wasn't that. It was just such a moment of pride. and That's what that moment is. 
That's how Jesus feels about his church. Hey, don't go touching it. I, uh, I remember with my children when they were, they were young. I, um, you know, kids can be a bit disrespectful to their mothers, can't they? Have you ever, have you ever, have you ever, anybody ever seen that? Have you ever had? And I was sat in the other room and I was listening to them being really disrespectful to their mum. And I was getting more and more and more cross. And I went in, I burst into the room. And I can shout, even though it might not sound like it now, I can shout. And I was so cross. And I shouted at them and I shouted, how dare you speak like that to my wife? And of course they were, because I was shouting. But then it dawned on them. It wasn't just their mum, this was my wife. They were being disrespectful to him. You hear what I'm saying? Brothers and sisters, don't be that person. Don't be like that. Should we cover stuff up? Never. Should we overlook sin? Never. But our attitude should reflect that of the groom. This church should be retreated, every church, the church should be treated with respect because this is who it is. The second thing is this. The bride is being prepared for the bridegroom. It's being prepared. That is what being the bride of Christ means. It means that we are being prepared. Okay? Therefore, we are open to be changed. It says here in Revelation, does it not? Uh, in Revelation 21 that we've just read. Revelation 21 verse 2. It says this, it says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Wow. It says in chapter 19, uh, verses 7 and 8, it says this, it says, um, 19, so let us rejoice and be glad and give, God, give, give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. An explanation, fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. There is a getting ready that goes on. Paul said the same thing in Ephesians 5. He said, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. Cleansing her by the washing of water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. You know, when you come to Jesus, I remember it well, when you come to Jesus, some things just stop, don't they? Just stop. I have a friend of mine, he said when he came to Jesus, he couldn't smoke. He just didn't want to smoke anymore. Gone, gone like that. Other people, it takes them ages <laughs> to, to stop those kinds of habits, right? Yeah? Some things change quickly. Some things are worked through your life, through your life. It's called sanctification. How do we know that we really belong, that we are really walking with Jesus? How do we know that we are filled with the Holy Spirit? It's because more and more we become like him. We take on his identity. We begin to look more and more like him. We take on his characteristics, the characteristics of the fruit of the spirit. When you're with somebody closely, you become like them. It's what happens. And we, in that relationship, are being made more holy. <laughs> We're being cleansed by washing the water of the word of God. We're being made more radiant, shining for him more. Our stains, the wrinkles, our blemishes on our lives give way to holiness and blamelessness according to this scripture. Yeah, my, I, I, I dearly love my dear old mum. She, she died a couple of years ago. Uh, I talk about her in nearly every message because she was just such an inspiration and such a, a wonderful, wonderful woman. I'll tell you stories endlessly about her. But the truth is, although I loved her and she was wonderful, she could be very difficult. She was, she was brought up in a very legalistic um, uh, environment through her years. And she carried it with her. That sense of legalism, of law-keeping, of rights and wrongs, and you're doing wrong and I'm doing right. And you're, you know, she, well, she was like that. And, and with it came some, quite some measure of judgmentalism, you know? <laughs> as, as happens if you're a bit legalistic. 
And I would talk to her for years. I'd try to explain things to her, and she just didn't get it. And it was like, oh, for goodness sake, I gave up, really. And when she was very elderly, she uh, got cancer. And she <coughs> fell out of her back door, smashed her face up, broke her neck. She was in a right old state. And we were due to visit from, to go to England. And she stayed alive, really, until we got there. And then she wouldn't die. She carried on for another 18 months after that. But she, she, everyone thought she was going to die, but she wouldn't, because we, we were going to come visit. So she stayed away, alive for that. But what was amazing, as I stood with her next to her bedside and talked to her, injured, sick, reduced, wanting to go home, she started talking to me about how God was speaking to her about the grace of God. And how she just all of a sudden recognised that that had been true for her. That God's grace had been extended to her unconditionally. And it was like a revelation to her. She'd been walked with Jesus all her life, nearly. But this truth, and that she said, do you know, I'm understanding I can extend that grace to other people, can't I? She got it. What was going on? God was sanctifying her. Elderly, sick, God was at work. Here I am, concerned for her well-being. Why would the Lord allow her to be so sick and so have all these things go? Well, actually, do you know, what was interesting is that the Lord's priority was not her health, but was her sanctification. If I could put it like this, the Lord's priority for you is not your success. The Lord's priority for you is your sanctification. Hello? If, if I might just burst a bubble or two, <laughs> if I'm allowed to do that. Can I just say, God isn't really very interested in your dreams. <laughs> you know, people say it all the time, don't they? Oh, my, he's not really very interested in your dreams. He is ever so interested and very concerned that his son has a bride who is fitting. He is concerned about that. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. The third point is this. That the big day is the biggest day of all eternity. It's extraordinary. This, this big day is, is not a projection of that little big day. It is the big day of all eternity. This big day is the day when the clouds will part and the Lord will return. This is the day when the kingdom of God is finally consummated. This is the day when the, the Lord will judge the living and the dead. This is that day when the, the, the world, the universe, and all that's in it will be remade. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Oh, this is the biggest day of all big days. You know, you might have thought, you might have thought your wife was making a big deal of the big day, but this is going to be the big day. And apparently, every bride looks forward to her big day, and sometimes those hopes are fulfilled, and sometimes they're not. All right? and sometimes it's a bit of a disappointment. All right? But according to Romans 8, we and the whole of creation are yearning for the world to be put to rights. For injustices to be made right. For creation itself to be renewed. For the fulfilment of the whole of the purpose of the universe to be revealed. And Revelation 21, which isn't difficult to find, says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Wow. I've, I've just finished recently reading a new book on um, the prisoner of war camp, Kolditz, which you might have heard of in Germany in the Second World War. Uh, quite some famous people were imprisoned in Kolditz, including Captain Charles Upham, VC and Bar, who was uh, uh, put there during the war and uh, tried to escape a few times. That's the story of Kolditz. The truth is it was a nasty place. Cold, hard, harsh, oppressive. And the Nazis were in control and it was nasty. And the prisoners 
tried to keep their stiff upper lip and tried to escape and do the best they could, but it was nasty. But everything changed when the Allies landed in France. The whole mood changed. They could see what was going to happen. Everything happened. Everything changed. Had it happened yet? Had they been liberated? No, not yet. But the change was there because the end was coming. Still nasty things happened. Still bad things happened. But they knew that very soon everything would be settled. Everything would be finished. Soon they would be liberated. Brothers and sisters, a healthy church is one that has its heart and its eyes set on Jesus. Set on Jesus and the hope of his return. The hope of his revealing an assurance of a life forever with him, together in eternity as his prize, his crown, his bride. Brothers and sisters, the church is the bride of Christ. The bride is one who is chosen and loved. So therefore we treat the church with respect. The church is the bride who's being prepared for her bridegroom. So therefore we are open to change. And the bride is being prepared for the biggest day of the biggest days of all eternity. And therefore we hope with excitement taking every opportunity to serve the Lord here and to proclaim to as many people as possible the wonderful, life-changing, victory-making gospel that prepares us to be with him forever and forever. The Lord bless you.